Welcome to the GS Podcast. I'm Stephen Knight. How's it going? Hope you're all well. Very pleased to be bringing you an episode with filmmaker Mike Arthur. Mike has made a fascinating documentary called I Pastafari. Now, many of you, especially those who took a keen interest in online atheism over the years, will be highly familiar with the flying spaghetti monster and what that represents. And um, Mike's put together a a truly fascinating documentary about it. Um, It covers the genesis of the flying spaghetti monster phenomenon, where it originated, what its intentions were, what it's now become. You know, you have to ask the question about whether or not it's it really is the world's fastest growing religion at the moment. Um, but his documentary is brilliant. Um, I saw it last year, at the tail end of last year. We actually recorded this conversation at the tail end of last year. And... Um, the documentary wasn't out at that point, so I've kind of held it back. I've kept it in my back pocket, even though my wonderful patron supporters have had access to it early. I've kept hold of it because I didn't see the point in telling you how amazing this film was, not knowing when it was going to come out. And by the time it does come out, you may have forgot about it. So I'm very pleased to let you know that it's now available via all your usual streaming platforms as of the 26th of May which is today at the time of recording and that's just for the UK uh, sort of European and Australian territories for America and Canada and further afield it's July the 7th but I think you can pre-order it now on iTunes I I shall put the relevant links to that in the show notes but definitely take a look it's it's, it's almost like a courtroom drama in places it's chronicles and I'm sure many of you may have read about this, people in uh, Holland challenging the religious privilege embedded in the state by, for instance, refusing to remove colanders from their head on, on photographs for driving licenses and, and various official photo IDs. And they challenge this in the court under the guise of religious freedom. They would argue that they are pastafarians they adhere to the church of the flying spaghetti monster and it is their religious right to wear a colander (laughs) in their photo id and obviously this sounds absolutely insane and ridiculous but then you have to contrast it with the fact that people with quote-unquote genuine authentic religions get to wear headscarves and headgear and various things like that and the state says that's okay so it's a way of challenging the religious privilege that's embedded within states and societies and it throws up very interesting questions about what is a real religion what counts as a true and sincere faith uh and it covers religious belief not only specifically but generally as well with these reference made to some of the more fundamentalist issues we have with Islam so it doesn't shy away from that kind of thing and it's really well handled very even handed and Mike's done a great job so what I would suggest is definitely check out the film these kind of smaller projects which are labours of love really Mike pretty much did this on his own it seems to be pretty much a one man project and this is somebody getting good objective and entertaining content out there that challenges religious privilege uh, and faith-based belief so if we want to see more of that in the mainstream we have to support it so definitely buy your copy now on google play or itunes or amazon wherever you can get it and uh, let mike and myself know what you thought Uh, you can get in touch um, with the official twitter account of this project at ipastafari doc i'll put a link to that in the show notes but like i said i really enjoyed it and um i've been sitting on this interview for several months now and now's the time to get it out there since you can all watch what i've seen so send some kind words in mike's direction you can also help him by leaving a positive review on rotten tomatoes or wherever wherever you purchased the video as well enjoy it's a great pleasure to welcome filmmaker Mike Arthur to the JS Podcast. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Stephen. Oh, entirely my pleasure. I've, um, I'll just say in off-air, I've just finished watching your extraordinarily 
funny and on point documentary I Pastafari. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into the particulars of that and the the flying spaghetti monster movement in general. Uh, but maybe you could tell me a little bit about you. How did you come to be involved in, in this project? What's your what's your background in terms of producing films? Yeah, I mean, I'm really kind of an accidental filmmaker. Um, I made a YouTube video for fun like five or six years ago. Uh, it was about online poker and it, it kind of took off on YouTube and I, I turned that into a Kickstarter campaign to raise funds to make a full length film. And then I made my first full length film and somehow sold it. Um, and so when you get that satisfaction of like, you know, taking an idea and making it into something, it's really hard to kind of go back to the cubicle, <laughs> you know? So um, at about the same time, my, uh, my wife got the opportunity to move out to Amsterdam and I basically said, Hey, you know, I'll move, but I want to try to make a second film. And so this is that second film. Um, so I mean, I had always been aware of the flying spaghetti monster, you know, it's always kind of been in the ether, but it really didn't catch my eye until I saw an article, uh, out here in the Netherlands about the Dutch pastafarians who were trying to get their, uh, ID photo wearing their holy headwear, which is a spaghetti calendar. Um, and so I, I was immediately intrigued because I'm, I'm a humanist. Um, and you know, uh, I'm also an American. So right now being a humanist and, a, and, and, and an American at the same time is a bit challenging due to our political situation and just the general uh, religious religious situation in the U.S., religious fundamentalist situation more specifically. Sure. Um, so I wanted to make a film about this idea of, you know, religious privilege, but I did not want to, you know, try to lecture people about beliefs or I didn't even want to get into that topic. You know, I just wanted to point out that, you know, Church and science, uh, you know, science is not religion and religion is not science. And when you combine the two, they both suffer. And so I felt this Pastafarian movement was a perfect way to kind of convey that. Um, so long story short, I uh, reached out to the Dutch Pastafarians. I found out there was a trial and I filmed the trial, not really knowing what to expect. Um, I didn't understand a word they were saying because it was all in Dutch. <laughs> yeah, sure. But just like the visuals of this dude in a colander in a very, <laughs> very serious <laughs> setting and just knowing that they were having this like really profound conversation about like what is a real religion and who decides that um, was fascinating to me. So, yeah, that kind of hooked me. And then then, yeah, the rest kind of came to fruition after that, um, after and it, and it took about three years. Um, from that trial until the first screening at the first film festival. Sure, yeah, I mean, it, it really reveals something putting this kind of uh, potential religious parody in the in the context of uh, a court trial on, on religious privilege, and it really highlights the sort of disparity, I, I think. But uh, maybe we could back up a little bit and talk a little bit about the the movement in general, the uh, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, the the adher- adherents known as Pastafarians. Uh, tell me a little bit about how this started and in reference to uh bobby henderson i believe is the founder yeah yeah the prophet bobby henderson so <laughs> peace be uh, upon him yeah pesto be upon him uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so in in 2005 the kansas public school board in the usa um, decided to change the definition of science in a way that would permit the supernatural to be a possible explanation for natural phenomenon so basically what they were trying to do is to teach creationism Right. or intelligent design, um, alongside Darwin's theory of evolution in public school science classes, so state-funded public schools. Uh, the argument was basically that they were both theories, so they should be given equal time in the curriculum. Um, you know, one theory is based in an old book, and the other is based on overwhelming observable evidence. So in response to this, a recent physics grad named Bobby Henderson wrote a letter to the school board and basically said that You know, if this were to be the case, then it would only be fair to teach this third theory in science as well, that a flying spaghetti monster created the universe a few thousand years ago. So in this letter, which is now known as the open letter to the Kansas school board, he brilliantly kind of used their logic and their methods of false equivalency to justify his own. Um, So one example, my favorite example from the letter is that he says that Pastafarian scientists figure out that climate change So the gradual increase of the average temperature of the earth is caused by the reduction in the pirate population. So he even provides a graph that shows over the last 200 years, the temperature has gone up and the pirate population has gone down. So therefore, we must need more pirates in order to combat climate change. 
So it, again, it's kind of this play on correlation versus causation and junk science, which is basically what you know intelligent design is. It isn't science at all. It's it's a belief system. Um. So yeah. So the the letter went viral online and went all over the world, and then ch- churches of the flying spaghetti monster started popping up everywhere. And this is kind of where my film begins, um, which I spoke. You know, in in, in two thousand and sixteen. Uh, a government agency in the Netherlands recognized Dutch Pastafarians as an official religion. And so that's where my film picks up. Wow. So, I mean, it's a bit of a headache for the the legal authorities in these in these countries because the this, this religious privilege for the standard monotheisms is already so ingrained that they're really faced with a choice of tearing down those privileges for everybody and making the state entirely secular in that sense or admitting that actually the church of the flying spaghetti monsters got just as much claim to religious status uh, as any other religion on the planet yeah basically i mean it, it, all the pastafarians i think and this is my interpretation as a filmmaker I, I can't speak for every pastafarian they're just as diverse as any other religious community but basically they just want equality <laughs> you know what i mean so whether if that means that uh, a privilege is going to exist, then everybody should get access to that privilege, regardless if you believe in, you know, God or Allah or the flying spaghetti monster or nothing at all. And yeah, I mean, you know, religious privileges and law exist because the church used to be the state, you know, the church used to run the schools, the church used to, you know, foster the governmental aspects of society. Uh, but over time, you know, those, those things became separate. And actually where I'm from, the U S we, we're the first country to really ingrain the separation of church and state into the constitution. And that, and that's because we saw all the harms that uh, combining those two aspects um, caused. So I find it quite ironic, you know, 200 years later that the state or the country with that has the, you know, separation of church and state ingrained in the constitution seems to be at the most odds with, <laughs> you know, church and state issues. Yeah. It is extraordinary. I mean, so maybe you can explain a little bit about, how this manifests because there's a long running theme within these religions in terms of uh you know headdress and colanders uh you know pa- pastor strainers then there's also people who who uh lean into the pirate aesthetic of the religion so uh, i mean uh, how can we uh, i suppose my question is how can we uh, prevent the uh, inevitable uh, decline into sectarian warfare between these two two sects within the movement yeah you know it's funny so so the colander thing didn't actually happen until 2011, so six years after the Bobby's uh, open letter, um, and that was created by Nico Alm, who uh, was a Austrian in Vienna, Austria. He was actually a member of the Austrian Parliament, um, and he just invented it to point out this inequality in in, in Austrian law. Um, but the OG Pastafarians, you know, that <laughs> that that and one of the uh, Nico Alm is actually in my film as well. Um, from the other side, I have Bruder Spaghettis, who's based out of Germany. His name's Rudiger Weider, Weida, and he created the first church of the flying spaghetti monster in Germany, a couple hours outside of Berlin. But he is very much a pirate, um, and all of the followers in Germany adhere to this pirate uh, interpretation of Pastafarianism. And there is kind of like a little rift, you know. Bruder Spaghettis in the film, it, you know, he says, you know, uh, we dress as pirates. The colander for us is blasphemic. Um, but it's funny because this rift is a bit of a satire on its own because they're basically pointing out all the rifts and all the conflicts of different sects of other faith groups. So the difference between the Pastafarians is that they have not had one holy war. They <laughs> don't have any suicide bombers. Um, they haven't had any major conflict. They're just kind of pointing out the ridiculousness of different sects of the same faith having conflicts based on interpretations of, of holy text. Um, so that, that's my interpretation of, of it at least, but yeah, it, it definitely provides for some, um, entertaining, but at the same time, like really thought provoking imagery and, um, debate. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously with them, uh, being featured in your documentary and wearing the headgear, I, I was wondering, is that, uh, you see, you know, you see in your documentary, you see people going around their day to day lives, wearing the colanders on the, on their head. And I was wondering, is that something they would do? absence of your your camera and crew or is this something that they uh they are doing just for the documentaries i mean is this really genuinely part of their day-to-day life yeah i mean some yes some no um so for example uh one of the dutch pastafarians uh, minka who is featured in the film 
she wore her colander in her head for three years and still does to this day. Um, she is a law student. Uh, and so she is fascinated with the whole legal aspect of um, this kind of debate between, you know, religion and church and state. And so, yeah, she has worn it basically every day in order to, you know, show that she does believe in the teachings of the flying spaghetti monster. No, you know, perhaps she doesn't believe literally in that a flying spaghetti monster created the, the, the earth, but she, she believes in the teachings of, you know, empathy, equality, uh, and not taking your religion too seriously. Um, so some do and some, some don't. Some, you know, they, they wear it occasionally uh, and they don't other times. And that's not really any different than other religious groups. You know, I have many Jewish friends who sometimes wear their yarmulke for certain rituals and holidays, and sometimes they don't. Um, I think you'll find that across many different faiths. So I don't, I don't, that's just another example of how Pastafarians are very similar to other faith groups that are recognized as legitimate. Do you think there is a, a, a possibility that, it, it, I suppose in reference to the Mormon faith, we have a, have a clear, I mean, it's a very young faith. We have a very um, documented view of the history of, of Joseph Smith and uh, how the Church of Mormonism originated, but that seems to be growing in numbers still and, and, and is an actual, you know, recognised, well-subscribed to religion. And it seems to me, in my own personal interpretation, that Pastafarianism is a very smart way of not only poking holes in religious privilege and uh, religious inconsistencies, but also creating a, a sense of community as well at the same time. So I'm wondering if it could evolve to something bigger than how it started. I mean, I know it already has in a sense, but could it? Be, could I find people knocking on my door trying to convert me to the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster at some point, do you think? <laughs> I don't think they'll go that far because, I mean, you know, the basis of their theology, for lack of a better word, is, you know, be cool. Don't be a, <laughs> don't be a dick. Basically <laughs> what we're all about. And, you know, so I don't think they'll uh, go be knocking on door to door, but I don't see any reason why in a hundred years, Pastafarianism wouldn't be recognized uh, as equals to other religions because they sh share a lot of the same aspects as other religions. Um, you know, and that's one of the main arguments in the, in the court cases is they basically say, you know, you can't have these privileges because you don't have a real religion okay, what's a real religion? Do they have millions of followers worldwide? Yes. Do they have a book? Yeah, they have the gospel, the flying spaghetti monster. Do they have stories uh, that convey message of morality? Absolutely. Do they have cultural traditions? Yeah, I capture many of those in the film. Um, are they old? Okay, how old? What's, <laughs> you know, what is that cutoff? And you mentioned Mormonism, that's 200 years old. Scientology is 50 years old. Uh, so yeah, I, I think the argument that it isn't a real religion is, 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 is very difficult to, to prove, um, especially in a, in a court setting. So with that logic, I don't see any reason why they couldn't become on the, you know, as, as large as these other faith communities. In fact, I mean, the, one of the ways I, I pitched the film or I, I, one of the tagline for the film is that, you know, it's the world's fastest growing religion. And that's not a play on words. I mean, that's that's true. Over the last 15 years, the Pastafarians went from zero to millions of followers. And every other religious group, for the most part, especially in the U.S., are on the decline. So I don't know. I think it'll be interesting to see. Uh, but I don't know if that's the purpose of Pastafarian or not. But I, I don't think that's the purpose of it. But I guess time will tell. Tell me a little bit about these uh, these rituals and cultural practices that you, you would attribute to this movement. Yeah, so Bruder Spaghettis, um, <laughs> he, he's the German, <laughs> he's the German Pastafarian that lives outside of Berlin, and he created a church. And over the last, I want to say, I think he opened the church in 2011, 2014, maybe. But he's created this whole set of rituals that includes songs. Um, that includes, you know, he, uh, the Catholic Church has the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. He has beer from the beer volcano and noodly from his noodly appendages. Um, they have all these like artifacts that they've created that kind of tells the story of Pastafarianism. You know, he has, he's got a uh, pasta roller that talks <laughs> about the prophet Bobby Henderson. Um, so, but the funny thing is, is that this was all kind of done, you know, to have fun, but what he's actually created is, is a community. He's commu created a community, uh, community of Pastafarians across the world that gather to have fun and enjoy each other and then be around like-minded individuals. So in that way, it very much is a religion. 
I mean, I'd, I'd say the biggest difference is that, you know, Pastafarians, and this is one of the main themes of the film, they've kind of grabbed onto the good parts of religion. So the community aspects, the cultural traditions, but they've gotten rid of some of the, the not so great aspects, you know, the, the discrimination, the hate, the anti-science nonsense. So in a way, Pastafarian is an evolved religion in that sense. And I think they're kind of calling other religions to evolve as well, to hold on to those great parts, you know, that, that the, the community aspects, but get rid of the bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, it, it, I mean, suppose one of, I, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, can I cuss or no? I don't. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, you have to, it's one of the rules. <laughs> uh, talk, talking of rules. Uh, so, so sort of contrast, this to some of the more better known monotheisms that have you know commandments uh the you know the church of flying spaghetti monsters got quite a novel take on this kind of thing maybe you could talk a little bit about the the sort of anti-commandments in a sense yeah so the film the structure of the film is based around these uh pastafarian commandments i guess for lack of a better word they're called the eight i'd really rather you didn't <laughs> The whole point of these is is to show that Pastafarianism isn't um, a belief system that punishes its followers for misdeeds. Um, some of these, I, I mean, some of these. Uh, uh, well, let me back up. So basically, I mean, there instead of these rules where they're strict rules, and if you don't follow them, you go to hell or you you know whatever. They're just kind of friendly suggestions on how to be a decent human being. Um, so I can actually here. Let me read some of them oh excellent okay so for example i mean the first eight i'd really rather you didn't is i'd really rather you didn't act like a sanctimonious holier than thou ass when describing my noodly goodness <laughs> if some people don't believe in me that's okay really i'm not that vain besides this isn't about them so don't change the subject <laughs> so obviously i mean there's they're, they're satire in there but there's meaning behind it too yeah it's basically saying just because somebody doesn't believe the same things as you doesn't mean they're a bad person um and yeah, and I, I can read another one. Go for it, yeah. Uh, I'd really rather you didn't use my existence as a means to oppress, subjugate, punish, eviscerate, and or, you know, be mean to others. I don't require sacrifices, and purity is for drinking water, not people. <laughs> so, right, I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I, so I, I structured the film around kind of these uh, moral suggestions um, because it really gets to the heart of the point behind the satire. That it's not just a joke. It's not just people wearing silly things on their head. They're actually conveying a very important message that feels like it's more relevant today than it was 10 or 15 years ago. I agree. I mean, satire is such a powerful tool. And it, this is this is very clever because the similarities, and it's, it's very clear to anyone who's not in a religious context or not you know, taking in it or living in a religious bubble, you can quite clearly see the patterns of comparison that this satire is trying to make and how it's exposing certain hypocrisies and various, uh, you know, privileges. And with you saying it's sort of the fastest growing religion, how many how many members are we talking here and, and where do you get this data from? Yeah, I mean, there's no census question on Pastafarianism, although in New Zealand, uh, I think there is some kind of, Count because there was an article in the New Zealand Herald a month ago that there were more Pastafarians in New Zealand than uh, Church of Destiny members, which is, I guess, is a, a church in New Zealand. Um, but no, I mean, basically, my reference point is uh, Facebook, and I mean, you can you can go on Facebook and look at Facebook groups in every, I mean, thousands, hundreds of countries all over the world have Pastafarian pages and groups. Um, but no, when I say millions. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that goes back to what do you define as a Pastafarian? I mean, myself, I'm a, I'm a humanist. You know, I, I'm an atheist, too. Um, but I also consider myself a, a Pastafarian. Do I wear a colander on my head? No, I don't. But I, I empathize with what they're trying to do and, and the meaning behind um, their faith, I guess, for lack of a... Non-devout. So, yeah, so uh, hopefully one day there will be a census question on Pastafarianism, but for now we'll just have to go with the uh, anecdotal evidence. Okay, and uh, I was very pleased to see Daniel Dennett make an appearance in the documentary as well, speaking a lot of sense on the um, cultural uh, impact of religion. Uh, and how, how did that come to be? How did you manage to get Daniel Dennett to appear in your film? And, and what was that experience like? Uh, it was great. He's one of my heroes. Um He's a guy that can really, truly articulate these complex issues in the most beautiful and insightful way. And so I did not think I had a shot in hell in getting him on this, this 
basically one man, tiny budget <laughs> uh, documentary. Um, I, I also reached out to, you know, the Richard Dawkins of the world, Sam Harris, um, you know, a bunch of other um, scientists, secular activists, so on and so forth. Uh, but they all have, you know, people to go through. And when you when it's me and I don't have a name and I don't have much of a resume, it doesn't go very far. Uh, but with Dennett, with Dennett, I just I emailed I emailed him and I sent him the trailer. So he knew it was a real thing. And he was just like, yeah, let's do it. Um, and that added an immense amount of value to the film because it, it, it helped me base what the Pastafarians were doing in not only reality, but also in, in history. And it helped me provide the proper context that I felt the Pastafarians deserved. Because really, that's why I made this film. I mean, most people, I'd say 90% of people who know about Pastafarianism just saw an article with some dude trying to get a uh, ID with a colander on his head. They thought it was funny, so they shared it on social media. Um, but they didn't understand the full context, the why. So that's why I felt it deserved a documentary to explain all these things. Um, and Daniel D- Dennett uh, really helped me do it in such a, a lovely way. And I'm forever grateful for him taking a chance on this no-name filmmaker. Excellent. Yeah, I was very pleased to see him there talking a lot of sense. Um, I suppose one of the, the key questions that I, I took away from this film, and I think most people will, is this idea of, well, what's a real religion? What is a real religion? What is the standard that you must clear in order to be classed as a, a, a real religion? And there's this section of a film where you, you're you using sort of uh, archival panel footage uh, inserted in there, and there's the, the kind of, there's a panel, and there's, there's one gentleman, he's really, he's sort of poo-pooing the flying spaghetti monster movement, saying it's just, you know, it's not a real religion, you know, uh, Rastafarian is a real religion but pastafarianism isn't and i think that really encapsulates the uh cognitive dissonance on this issue doesn't it yeah absolutely and it's funny because the pastafarian movement and what i try to capture in this film is that there are so many kind of layers to what they're doing and that that definitely is one of the layers right what is a real religion and if the answer isn't super clear and crisp then why are we basing laws on that like why, yeah why, like, but the greater kind of question that I'm trying to frame up, and I think the Pastafarians are trying to frame up, is what is what kind of behaviors in society do we deem – do we want to subsidize? Do we want to promote? Do we want to encourage by tax subsidies or you know privileges or exceptions? Is it this idea of blind faith or is it critical thinking in science? I would propose that critical thinking in science will be – have you know, have – basically provided most of society's advancement over the last, you know, since the enlightenment, why that isn't at the forefront of, you know, tax exemptions and (laughs) whatever, or at least on the same footing as, as faith is, is mind blowing to me. So that's really what I think that the Pastafarians are trying to get at. They're trying to force society to ask the question, what's important to us? I mean, maybe you could tell me a little bit about, I mean, cause I find it quite fascinating that the way you got on this, um, this filmmaking journey in a sense was the internet and, and using YouTube to create content and putting it out there to the world. I just wanted to get a f- your opinion on how much that's democratized the process in, in terms of filmmakers, people who've got, you know, big, big and interesting ideas, but traditionally years ago, wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to secure the funding or equipment or the distribution model. Now, however, they can make something and if it's good enough or if it's interesting enough to enough people, it, it'll get seen and shared and talked about. So maybe you can speak a little bit about how, how big a role uh, the internet has, has had on filmmaking? Well, I mean, you know, I'm not a traditional filmmaker. You know, I, I didn't go to film school. I, I don't have this vast network of producers and financiers or anything like that. In fact, I mean, this this film was financed by the, the Pastafarian community and my own savings account. Wow. <laughs> so I have a, yeah, I have a GoFundMe. First rule of filmmaking, it's... never use your own money, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I'm, that just shows the lack of experience I have being a <laughs> filmmaker, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, this really was a, a passion project that kind of got out of hand, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I have a GoFundMe and I've raised about 20,000 bucks, um, from the Pastafarian community and the rest, I've just kind of gone out of pocket. So I, I don't have any financing. That's part of the reason why the film that you saw was 40 minutes long. Right. Um, I basically did everything I could. Uh, and I came to a point where I knew I needed help. I need to, in order to get up to this next step to make this thing commercially viable and, and, and like a uh, you know commercially successful independent film, I needed help. I needed financing. Uh, financing. I needed a network of people. I needed some 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 people that are specialized in technical skills that I don't have. 
And so I, I eventually I, I made a decision that I'm just going to send this to film festivals as kind of a mid-length short with the hope that through those film festivals, I could network and meet people and, and find somebody else who kind of got why this film was special. Um, because obviously I think it's special, but you know, I'm the filmmaker, of course, <laughs> I, convincing somebody else to do it. That's, that's the challenge. So, so are you saying you, there may be an opportunity, you're looking for a potential opportunity to expand on the running time uh, in collaboration? Yeah, that's with exactly, people? Okay. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. I mean, I, I would like to make it a 70 to 75 minute film. Um, because uh, a feature film will be much easier to get out there to find distribution to get accepted to some of these you know bigger film festivals than a 40 minute film that's very difficult to program um, so that's that's my hope is uh, one I want to get the prophet Bobby Henderson involved um, that's the one piece of the film that I feel like is is really missing and that if I added that it would just be so authentic and would really connect a lot of the dots that I've left you know, people to kind of have you, have you opened communication with Bobby Henderson at all? Yeah, I have. I, you know, I, I reached out to him at the very beginning of this uh, project and, you know, he, he didn't respond to me for a while. Um, is, because he, I didn't, is he someone who yeah. does uh, sort of media appearances? I don't, I don't recall. He doesn't. He doesn't. No, he doesn't at all. He, he, I think he's, he's done a few articles over the last 15 years. One was a recent article on the guardian right. um, where he's, about what it's kind of become and he authored the gospel as well didn't he the the book he that did. you can buy right exactly he wrote the gospel but he has not gone on tv he doesn't do press and he does that by design i think i mean the whole point of kind of this religion is not to have any hierarchy not to set any rules and uh, you know i think him kind of being behind the scenes uh helps live up that dogma or lack of dog dogma i guess <laughs> whatever you want to call it um, but no, I mean, I, so we have been in contact over the last year via email. He's been very helpful kind of sharing, um, the project as it progresses, you know, he's, he shared once it's got into a few festivals, he shared the fundraising campaign. Um, he's, he's done things like this that have been really helpful and have really opened up some doors for the film that I couldn't do without him. But that being said, there's a perspective there that I find fascinating that fits into this film perfectly. So I'm still going to try to get Bobby Henderson involved, um, but we'll see. Yeah, if, he, if I can't get him involved, there's other ways I think I can expand the film. I'd love to get some American Pastafarians involved because <laughs> all the Pastafarians so far are uh, European Pastafarians. Um, so I have a bunch of ideas, but I, I need to find funding um, to, to make it happen. So that's kind of the next step if that doesn't work out. And if I can't find a distributor with a, the current version, I'll, I'll, I'll independent release it, uh, independently release it myself, probably by the end of next year. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, so, yeah. uh, I mean, you've been taking it to festivals, as, uh, as you've said. What's the reaction been like there? Awesome. Unbelievable. Oh, like, great. Well beyond my expectations. Um, I mean, the we, we screened at the Bend Film Festival, which ironically was the festival that inspired me to be a filmmaker in the first place. I, I went there just as a audience member back in like 2010 and just seeing people on these panels, filmmakers on these panels, like, you know, get to talk about stuff that they were interested in. I just fascinated me because at that time I was working in corporate retail and I would give these presentations in front of big groups of people about stuff I didn't care about. Where, you know? where, where is that festival based and it, does it have any particular genre or is it a kind of a mix of different types of films? Yeah, it's, it's based in Bend, Oregon, um, right. which is on the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful town. Um, but yeah, I went there as an audience member. I was enthralled and at, leaving that, I made the short YouTube video that led me to kind of become... A filmmaker so it was really special to go back there as like a legit <laughs> <You know what? laughs> as a filmmaker but the response was amazing we we showed out we, we sold out the first show within two weeks so like three weeks before the screening the second show we had almost 200 people in a huge theater and then there was so much demand for the film the uh, film festival added an encore screening on the last day um so it was well beyond anything i anticipated i, I thought you know the second show with 200 people almost 200 people was at 10 a.m on a saturday i, I was anticipating watching that by myself <laughs> <laughs> so, how validating then that's great news um so just staying on the filmmaking for a second and, and being a bit nerdy I, I suppose with you being a you know almost a one-man team traveling you know hopping around europe trying to get 
secure interviews and things like that. What what sort of advice could you give to young filmmakers in terms of equipment and, and capturing sound at a you know a quality level and, and things like that? I mean, what sort of budget are we looking at, and what sort of equipment is is utterly essential to that kind of project? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I did it with a, a three thousand dollar Sony A seven S two right digital camera uh in like normal lenses so nothing too fancy i did hire a few people to shoot some interviews that i couldn't travel to so for example daniel dennett i hired somebody to to, to film that for me all right um so yeah i mean it, it just depends on what your expectation and your goals are i mean my goal was to make something i could be proud of that i could hopefully find a distributor for i didn't think that there would be a theatrical release or anything like that so yeah i i I don't know. I mean, in many ways, it's not sane to be an independent filmmaker because the chances are not in your favor. You mentioned earlier how, you know, camera equipment getting so affordable and, you know, the Internet making uh, content so accessible has really democratized it in a way. Yeah, it has, but it, it's also created an influx of yeah, it's saturated as well. Isn't yeah, it? it's the market is absolutely saturated. So in order to stand out, you still need you know, you, you still need like a PR firm, you still need financing, you still need help, you know, and, unless it's this one in a million shot, which those exist, but I, I don't find it rational to plan for that to happen. So the only thing that kind of got me from where I started and where I am today is, is borderline insanity, because I thought it was such an important story. And it was so interesting that I, I didn't pay attention really to all the obstacles. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit of na- naivety can go a long way then when you're first starting out, do you think? Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you're passionate about it, if it's interesting, and if it's not just another version of another film somebody else with more money is going to make, then it's worth the risk. And that's what I feel I have with this film. I mean, I get a lot of comparisons to Hail Satan. Uh, I was working on this film for like a year and a half when I first found out about Hail Satan, which is a Penny Lane's documentary about the Satanist uh the church of not the church of Satan, but the satanic temple. Yeah. Um, so I was a little worried that, you know, somebody with more talent and more budget than, than, than me was going to kind of make a film with a similar theme, but the films are really, really different. And if anyway, I think Penny has kind of trailblazed the path for me to follow and has made this concept, you know, this idea that religion shouldn't be immune to, to criticism or, or critical debate, uh, the thing of the past. So, and I think our films are different. You know, I I find pasta to be more digestible than Satan for a large population. So. <laughs> maybe, Slow maybe releasing carbs. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what's next in terms of, of this project? How can people not only find more information about it, but spread the word and, and chip in in any way and help? Yeah, I mean, you know, right now I'm at this, the cusp. You know, is this thing going to be a 40 or 50 minute film? Am I going to find a distributor for kind of what it is now? Or will I be able to find a partner or raise the funds I need to, to really have a good chance of making it commercially viable, a.k.a. getting it to a wide audience? A lot of some things are in motion now, but, uh, you know, I'm still kind of cold emailing distributors and kind of trying to get this film in, in front of as many people as possible. The Guardian did an article on the film um, like a month ago, which was really, really helpful. Uh, I definitely recommend everybody read that. But yeah, I mean, really just sharing the trailer, following the film on social media, because that's a a good business case for this film to distributors is to show that I've already built an audience. And uh, and yeah, and obviously the GoFundMe, you can pre-order the film. That's obviously helpful. But yeah, share the trailer, follow the film on social media and just, you know preach the gospel of the flying spaghetti monster <laughs> do, you, do you think this film will uh is it you know when you say you pre-order it is this uh solely digital or do you envision a physical release at some point as well i i, I mean if i independently release it it'll be solely digital right um if i if i get the funds to make it into a 70 minute film then then there might be more options beyond that um but yeah i mean like i said right now is this inflection point where i've just shown it at, at film festivals there's kind of some buzz kind of growing with this guardian article now I got to figure out a way to transform that into making this, you know, a legit um, commercial feature length film. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, we spoke a little bit about this before we started, but I said that I found it really even handed. You're not 
pushing an agenda or a message you or sort of saying there, there, there is this phenomenon and here's the questions that it's bringing up and you're, you're asking the viewer to really make their own minds up you're not ramming any sort of anti-theist message down people's throats uh, you're not telling you're not even telling people that the religion of the flying spaghetti monster is satire you're not telling them it's a bona fide religion you're asking them to make up their own minds and how did you um how did you resist the urges to insert your own biases into this documentary is is there any moments of things where you you got into editing and thought you know what that's probably best not being put into the movie how did you remain so even-handed with it well i I guess i didn't really even think like that i i I tried to stay true to what the pastafarians were doing and that's why i loved the pastafarians is because you know that it seems like today having a debate about religion's impact on society is is next to impossible because we kind of split into these two teams and we don't listen to each other we just yell at each other and basically any conversation about religion either ends with somebody being condescending towards somebody else or somebody saying well you just got to have faith Mm. and when you see all these headlines (laughs) about mostly religious fundamentalism I, i i don't think um I think we, we, we owe ourselves as a society to debate religion as we would any other uh, policy. But at the same time, the Pastafarians aren't trying to lecture anybody. They're, they're using this method that kind of tricks you into critically thinking for yourself. And that's what I think the issue with society is today. All these conflicts, whether it's you know in the U.S., the you know, conservative versus liberal or Brexit versus Remain, all these are kind of, if you drill these down, they're all based on this lack of critical thinking. You know what I mean? It's, it's this acceptance of blind faith. You know, Trump is our savior yeah. <laughs> or the big red bus versus actually critically thinking about the long-term impact of some of these decisions. So that's what I loved about the Pastafarians is that they were critically, they were tricking people into critically thinking for themselves. And so that's what I tried to maintain in the film. There's another part though, that I've showed this film to many religious people. You know, with various uh, on the on the spectrum between you know very very religious and just culturally culturally religious, and they got it. I mean, they 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 agreed that science is not religion, religion is not science, and when you mix the two, they both suffer. They agree in this idea of religious freedom, which is what the Pastafarians are fighting for. You know, I mean, you can't. The thing is, you can't have religious freedom. Unless there's a separation of church and state, because the second a state a state says, you know, your beliefs are real and yours are not, <laughs> here's some privileges you get none. That's a violation of the human right that is religious freedom. And you also can't have religious freedom unless religious freedom is equivalent to freedom from religion, because the second you kind of push your beliefs or create or, or push for laws that force people to go against their religious beliefs, that's a violation of their religious freedom. So that's really what I liked about the Pastafarian movement is that they were doing all these things, but in a very entertaining way. Because uh, unfortunately, you know, we live in this world where Kim Kardashian's Twitter feed gets more attention than legit journalism. So <laughs> that is a terrifying Pastaf- thought, isn't it? If that's not <laughs> if that's not one of the signs of the apocalypse, I don't know what is. I agree, man. But that's the thing. They're, so they're, that's why they're doing the colander. I think is because it's a clickbaitable way to bring attention to a serious issue. And the last thing I'll say is um, about this, this subject is that, you know, I, I explain it to people like this sometimes. It's like when you see dog shit on the sidewalk. As a dog owner myself, I'm like more upset about that because it makes me look bad. I think most religious people are culture religious. They're, they're, they're rational. They're empathetic. They value this cultural tradition that is deep rooted in their history and their family upbringing. They're even more pissed off about religious fundamentalists spewing hate and not getting vaccines and taking their private jets to go preach that science is a conspiracy. So the only thing that's missing is that I feel like the rational majority of religious people are, are, are kind of stepping aside and, and not really speaking up. And that's one thing I'd like to change. I'd like the secular community and the and the culturally religious community to kind of join forces to end or at least speak out against religious fundamentalism. 
Yeah, that would be the ideal. I think I might steal that dog shit analogy as well, Mike. Thank you for that. That, that works lovely. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I, I really love the film. Um, I, I hope you get lots and lots of eyes on it. I hope it, it progresses in a, in a direction that you, you want it to and it, it expand. I hope that's on the horizon. Um, so I'll, I'll be banging the drum about it to anybody who uh, who will listen. Um, it, I was wondering as well, is that where can my audience find you or find information on the film if they want to learn more? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a website. It's www.ipostafaridoc.com, but also on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, it's at ipostafaridoc. Great. Those are the two best places to to kind of keep in keep in touch with what's happening with the film. Excellent. I'll I'll be sure to include them in the show notes. But Mike, uh, that's that's pretty much everything I wanted to get through. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. Is there is there anything else you want to say before I let you get back to your afternoon? Um, no, I don't think so, man. I think I think that was a great conversation, and I, I hope your listeners enjoy it. I loved it. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Well, let's uh, stay in touch, and yeah, thank you. Definitely. Speak to you soon. All right. Take it easy, Steve. Thank you for listening to the Godless Spellchecker podcast. The podcast is a one-man operation, producing my spare time away from my day job. And and I love making it for you. If you enjoy what you hear, please consider lending some support. The show is entirely listener supported. I don't sell anything, I don't run ads, and uh, given the alternative and unpopular focus of my content, it's very unlikely to find a sponsor. So there are a number of ways you can support and chip in and, and help improve the show and give me more time to produce more content. You can become a patron supporter and pledge a monetary amount per month or per episode by visiting patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker. If you can't lend monetary support right now, don't worry, there's other ways you can help the podcast too. You can share it on your various social media networks, or take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to it. Your support is massively appreciated. Thank you. Think we've all learned something here today? 